Hello, Maple. Guess who? Can you guess? <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> um, well, I wonder if that little pact that Owl and um, Pi made, will they meet up again? Let's see. Chapter 46. Standing outside the vets, the absolute lunacy of handling over my mobile phone to Macca has begun to seep into my head, and I comfort myself, although very slightly, with the knowledge that there wasn't much battery life left, and he won't be able to do much with it, but I will have to get it back, I know that much. I'm also now very keen to get back to my world, my time. The idea of flipping between the two as I wish, of setting destination, and returning times according to convenience is something I'm only just becoming familiar with and I'm very, very far from relaxed about the whole thing. You'd be the same. No one is born with an instinctive understanding of multi-dimensional time travel. Well, not yet at any rate. There's also, also the risk element. It's the breaking in, the sneaking around, the lying, the hiding and stealing stuff it's really doing my head in, as much as the time travel itself. Mind you, the time tra travel would be enough on its own, believe me. I wait till Macca and Pi have headed up the road, away from the house, and there is no one around in Chesterton Road. Then I head back to the bunker, under his, stroke my house. Remember, several hours ago, but 30 years in the future... I had only just escaped being found in this same bunker by Graham, who was trying to force the door. I remember that now. I'd had the brilliant idea of using the time machine to escape imminent danger. Brilliant, cunning and completely stupid. Because I'm now sitting in front of the laptop with nowhere to go. Ret returning before I had left was a non-starter because of Dad's law of doppelgangers. Remember? I would risk bumping into myself, and that's just not possible. And returning after I had left doesn't work either, for exactly the same reason. That leaves the option I had rejected before as Graham was forcing the metal door, find somewhere to hide in the bunker, and I would only have seconds to do it. I scan the layout of the little underground room. There's only one possible hiding place, and it's pretty pathetic. I set the time coordinates for the time I left, and then I hesitate, going through all the what-ifs I can think of. What if Graham just waits by the door? What if he locked the door from the outside? The main one, of course, is what if he finds me? What if, what if, what if? Sometimes, despite the what-ifs, you just have to act. I can't be here forever driving myself nuts with indecision. Instead, reclaiming Alan Shearer from the drawer and stashing him safely in my hoodie pocket, I climb into the tub, grip the laptop tightly and press enter. Seconds later, I'm back where I left. I can again hear the pieces of broomstick clattering to the floor and the wheel that opens the door is turning rustily. One piece of wood remains stuck jamming the door's mechanisms for a few more vital seconds as I climb out of the tin tub and hit the light switch just as the final bit of wood gives way. Careful, Graham, careful. There might be a gang of them, I hear Bella say as he pushes the door open. There are five stairs leading down into the bunker from the doorway and all I can do is to crouch in the space beneath them. I know, I told you it was pathetic, right? Worse, the steps are made of grid metal like you see in factories, and if he looks straight down, Graham will see me crunched up in a ball, I screw tight shut, if that would make as if that would make a difference to whether he sees me or not. Half opening them, I see a shaft of dim light coming from the doorway and falling on the laptop and tin bath. The laptop is closed, but between the keyboard and the screen is a thin line of light because it hasn't powered down properly yet. Can he see it? I can't tell. He's crouching by the open door because at the top of the stairs, there's not enough headroom to stand up properly and his feet are directly above me. Hello, he calls. I know you're in there. You'd better come out or you're in trouble. 
He's scared. I can tell from his voice. Then his feet move and he starts to come down the metal steps. Don't go in, Graham. Don't, Graham. Come back, love. He stops and I have an idea. Silently, I take Alan Shearer from my pocket and gently release him onto the floor where he scampers across the patch of light behind the twin tub. He's only visible for a moment, but it's enough. Oh my gosh, Bella, there's rats down here. Yep, I think to myself, rats for babies. And I think I even smile a bit remembering Carly's sly put down. Bella's voice has taken on a slightly sharper tone. Graham, come away now. You'll catch something if they bite you. His footsteps move back up the stairs and I hear him say to Bella, Come on, love, we'll call the police. And the council, we need the pest controllers. I hear the door between the kitchen and the garage click shut and only then do I realise that I have been holding my breath for pretty much the whole of that time. Seconds later, I've scooped up Alan Shearer and I'm out of the bunker, down the driveway, grabbing my glove and sprinting to the chip shop where Grandpa Byron is waiting for me. I walk in trying to pretend that nothing has happened and hoping that Grandpa Byron won't notice anything. I mean, what is there to notice? I look fine. Oh my jolly goodness, what on earth is the matter? Well, all right, so much for that theory then. Grandpa Byron's staring at me. He looks at his watch. You were nearly 20 minutes, he says. Trouble finding it? I blink, then hold up the glove. Uh-huh, but I got it. Wow, I'm thinking 20 minutes. For me, it's been several hours, but Grandpa Byron has only been here 20 minutes, except those hours must still have happened. Those hours happened to me, so they must have happened to Grandpa Byron. But when? That's the question I simply cannot answer. How could something happen, yet not happen? All of this is going through my head while Grandpa Byron keeps asking me questions. Where have you been? I was about to come looking for you, man. Are you, are you all right? You look terrible. What happened? There's a big mirror down one wall of the chip shop, and I actually look at my reflection. Well, honestly, I don't look that bad. A bit dishevelled, maybe. And my hands are filthy. And there are a few smudges of dirt and sand. And they're all on my face from brawling with pie. And my feet are wet from where a wave caught me. And yeah, OK, hands up. I look a bit messed up. Um, I couldn't find it. And then I was running back and I tripped. And what about your feet? They're soaking wet, man. A puddle, a puddle. I stepped in a puddle. If Grandpa Byron realises the absurdity of this, it's a sunny, dry day with no puddles. He isn't showing it. He stares at me really carefully as he slowly eats a chip. Then he makes a face. Yuck! They're cold. Ah, away with them. Let's go. I would love, love, love to tell Grandpa Byron that I've just met Dad. But I can't. The frustration keeps me quiet, and I can't talk on the back of his scooter anyway. And besides, one thought is crowding everything else. I must save the time machine from discovery when Bella and Graham's builders get to work. That could be as early as tomorrow. One way or another, I'm going to be back in Caldercott this very night. Wow, it's really complicated, isn't it? It's quite a lot to keep up with everything. Like Grandpa Byron, 20 minutes. Al had been gone for hours. I must admit, Maple, I'm not going to pretend that I understand time travel. But I'm still enjoying reading about it. OK, then. Well, I hope you enjoyed that too. And I will catch up with you again tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye.